those of you who don't know Community Alliance for Global Justice, um, we're a member-led Seattle-based grassroots organization that came, was founded by folks who helped organize a protest against the World Trade Organization in 1999. We were formed in 2001, so we've been around for a little while. And we still uh, work on trade justice. Um, specifically right now, we have to do everything in our power to stop the Trans-Pacific Partnership from being passed by Congress over the next few months. We also organize for food justice, we're a food justice project through political education and by working in solidarity with frontline communities. For example, um, we're part of the Seattle Boycott Committee, um, standing in solidarity, organizing weekly pickets with Familias Unidas por la Justicia, Families United for Justice, which is the independent um, and really historic farm worker uh, union that formed two years ago um, near Mount Vernon and that's getting a lot of support from the amazing organization Community to Community based in Bellingham. Um, and our third program is Augur Watch, our campaign targeting the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for their role in agricultural development so-called development in Africa. So tonight's event evolved out of two desires. One was to recognize the significance of the 40th anniversary of Food First, um, who's really an essential part of the movements for food justice and food sovereignty. Um, there are people's think tank that provides really invaluable analysis and leadership. And we urge you to become a member. They're also a membership organization. Um, and just to give an example, when we learned that um, the Gates Foundation was promoting a new green revolution in Africa, we went to Food First. And of course, they, are, they already were writing about it. And we learned about you know, the early days where we sort of figured out what was happening from them. And it's gone from there. Um, our other goal tonight is to participate in the increasingly rich conversations happening in our state, and of course globally, but um, really excitingly in our state around climate justice. Um, so first, I want to mention two specific things. One is the Gates Divest campaign that's demanding that the Gates Foundation divest from their $1.4 billion investment in major fossil fuel companies. Um, and the Guardian newspaper is also doing this organizing, but they have a five-year timeline. Gates Divest is a local branch, or they started independently, actually, and their demand is that they divest by November 30th, which is the start of the climate talks. Um, and we totally salute their organizing. They're doing great work. They got the former mayor on their side. They're doing creative protests frequently outside the foundation, which we've done over the years as well. But we're really excited to have a great partner in pressuring the Gates Foundation. Um, and we also really appreciate that they, you might have gotten our great new flyer tonight, that they welcome um, the, our addition to their message that it's not enough to divest from fossil fuel um, investments in those big companies if the Gates Foundation wants to make a difference because they are promoting agribusiness and agribusiness is one of the greatest contributors to global warming and to climate change. Um, so please, don't let the Gates Foundation off the hook. We have a fear that they'll be the good guy if they divest, and they certainly should not be allowed to be seen as a good guy or any greenwashing to come out of that if they were to take that action. Um, the second thing is a statewide organizing being led by communities of color for climate justice and under the umbrella of a new coalition, the Alliance for Jobs and Clean Energy. Um, this is an amazing development in our state, really, really important, and um, I'm so excited that we're able to ground the big analysis that Eric will give tonight in a specific local organizing being led. Um, especially, we're uh, really excited to see the leadership of both Got Green and Community to Community in this work. And the executive director, Jill Mangaliman, is here um, to talk about that organizing after Eric. Um, so we really appreciate Jill being here as well. So as a group focused on food sovereignty, our AgriWatch campaign takes our lead from our African partners, and as a whole, our organization um, takes the lead from the leadership of global organization, the Glo global organization of peasants, La Via Campesina, both of whom promote agroecology as a key climate justice strategy. And one of the groups we work with is ASFA, the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. And last week, they released a statement calling agroecology the future of farming in Africa. So part of the purpose of this event tonight was just to to be um, highlighting that work that's being done. And I just want to read a short part of, of their statement. Um, they say, in many ways, agroecology is the antithesis of current conventional corporate-driven monoculture-based agricultural systems, where conventional agriculture seeks to simplify, agroecology embraces complexity. Where conventional agriculture aims to eliminate biodiversity, agroecology depends on diversity and builds upon it. Where conventional agriculture turns farmers into unskilled laborers, Agroecology is knowledge intensive, 
building on traditional agricultural practices with modern research and technology, strengthening the sovereignty of small-scale family farmers. Where conventional agriculture is based on one-size-fits-all fixes like GMOs, chemical fertilizers, and pesticides, agroecology provides local solutions to local problems. The strongest resistance to agroecology comes from the vested interests of agribusiness, fertilizer, agrochemical, and biotech companies that are, quote, claim they're feeding the world as the narrative to increase their profits from input sales. Does Africa want to take its farmers down the industrial agricultural route just because there is money on the table? This is the crucial question for policymakers across the continent. So Eric Holte Menes is the perfect person to help us make all these connections. <clears throat> he's an author, he's an organizer, he's a researcher, but most importantly for this moment in our movement building, Eric is an agroecologist. In his role as executive director of Food First, the Institute for Food and Development Policy, Eric's familiar to a Seattle audience. Last year, he moderated the panel that we organized at Town Hall during the Africa-US Food Sovereignty Strategy Summit. Um, he also, another really memorable event that Brandon Bourne was also a big part of, um, was on the 10th anniversary to the day of the WTO protests. Um, were any of you at that event in Gould Hall? We got 300 people that night. That was an amazing <laughs> event as well. Um, of Basque and Puerto Rican heritage, Eric grew up milking cows and pitching hay in Point Reyes, California, where he learned that putting food on the table is hard work. After studying rural education and biology at the University of Oregon and my alma mater, Evergreen State College, Eric spent the next 25 years working in Mexico and Central America with farmers. His first book, Campesino a Campesino, Voices from Latin America's Farmer to Farmer Movement for Sustainable Agriculture, documents his involvement with the Campesino a Campesino movement. And the significance of the Farmer to Farmer movement was um, recognized when the Farmer to Farmer movement was awarded the Food Sovereignty Prize in 2011. He earned his PhD in environmental studies from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and has taught at many universities around the world, including UC Berkeley, UC Santa Cruz, Antiquia University in Colombia, and the International University of Gastronomy in Italy. Eric served as the Latin America Program Manager for the Bank Information Center in Washington, D.C., before becoming the Executive Director of Food First in 2006. So please join me in welcoming my friend and comrade, Eric holti um, I love coming to Seattle. I lived in the Pacific Northwest for a number of years. Um, I mean, before I went to school in, at Evergreen, I lived on the San Juan Islands for a while. And, um, I got here the other day and I didn't know where I was because it was sunny and warm and pleasant and now it's good old miserable Seattle again. It's, I feel right at home. Um, I, it's a, really an honor to be here um, and because Food First is really about this, um, this connection between intellectual work and activism. And so it's no mistake that we're here at the University of Washington um, with a partnership with uh, CAGJ and uh, other activists. And I'm sure many of you in the room are students and activists and professors and activists and activists and activists. And um, this is whom Food First tries to serve. We're a people's think tank. Um, and we have been around for 40 years thanks to the people. We don't get money from foundations. We got a little bit of grant money from time to time, but we've stayed active for 40 years researching the injustices that cause hunger and what to do about it, amplifying the voices of the social movements and trying to um, inform the general public um, thanks to individual contributions. People who give us anywhere from five, to, I'm not kidding, five dollars a year um, and then call on the phone and want to talk for half an hour about uh, food first um, to you know maybe five thousand dollars a year or more and we have around five to seven thousand uh, supporters at any one time and that's how we stay independent that's how we get to set our own research agenda um, and our research agenda we uh, make sure that it's uh, accountable to uh, the people which, for whom we, in whom we believe. Um, so, tonight I want to talk about climate, food, and race, challenges for the food movement. Some of you who have heard me speak before will recognize a number of the themes, but I really want to address um, 
see, look at how our food system and our food movement and the inequities and the um, injustices of those also link with climate uh, and the injustices that are taking place today around climate. I want to start with a story. So once upon a time, in a land not too far away, an enormous hurricane slammed into the isthmus. Um, and it was called the Hurricane of the Poor because the 10,000 people who were killed were primarily poor people. They were primarily peasants, um, slum dwellers. Uh, the three million who were displaced were prim primarily peasants and slum dwellers. This hurricane was not the most powerful hurricane in the history of the region, but it was the most destructive hurricane in the history of the region. Uh, damages were calculated above 13% uh, of the regional's gross national product. And the reason that it was so destructive was that the region was, had been made highly vulnerable over the last 100 years through deforestation, the expansion of industrial agriculture, soils were exposed, uh, peasant farmers who had been farming on the bottomland had been pushed off to make way for industrial agriculture, had gone up into the hillsides and into the mountains, living very precariously. And of course, when the hurricane hit, they were washed down the hill. Um, except the farmers from this movement called Campesino Campesino. Because the farmers in the Campesino Campesino movement had spent about 30 years forging their own agriculture, farmer to farmer, doing their own experimentation, weaning themselves from chemicals and hybrids and from green revolution techniques, implementing very labor intensive but extremely effective uh, terracing and soil building practices. And when the hurricane hit and pretty much destroyed agriculture throughout Okay, it's Central America. These farmers, their farms were not destroyed. The neighbors' farms were destroyed, but these farmers made it through. Their farms were resilient. Actually, their farms were resistant to the impact of the hurricane. And when everybody sort of dug themselves out and looked around, they realized the farmers still had a lot of food and, and they were selling this food and they were actually making some money because nobody else had any food. Um, and they said, you know, we want to rebuild our region, but we shouldn't rebuild it using conventional agricultural techniques because they're too vulnerable. Look what's happened. They've been destroyed. We should use our agroecological techniques, our sustainable farming techniques. We should rebuild sustainably. But they knew no one would believe them. So they carried out a massive study in three different countries in Central America, where they measured the impact of the hurricane on their farms and then on their neighbors' farms. So it was a comparative study between agroecological farms and conventional farms under the exact same conditions across the entire isthmus in conditions of low, medium, and high uh, impact from the hurricane. 2,000 farmers participated, most of whom were illiterate. Um, took about three or four months to pull this off. There were um, about 100 teams that worked together. These are all the spots where they made observations. And there were about 40 uh, non-governmental organizations and farmers organizations that participated in this tremendous research, popular research mobilization. And when the data came in, it was overwhelming. The agroecological farms, that's the A up there, had fewer landslides, had more topsoil, had less erosion, had more vegetative cover, had fewer losses, actually made some profits, managed to conserve more soil and water. Um, every single one of the indicators, the agroecological agro farms from these farmers won. They published in peer-reviewed journals, 
they called the ministries of agriculture and the ministries of foreign cooperation together in great uh, conferences in each of the capital cities. They presented their work, everybody applauded, and they made their case. And it was a scientific case. They said, look, let's rebuild Central American agriculture. Let's rebuild it sustainably. We know how to do it. We've proven it. You haven't believed us for 30 years, but here's the proof. We are more sustainable, and we can teach everybody else, and it'll be cheap. And everybody applauded and said, okay, look, we're going off to Spain. We'll be back in a few months with a plan for Central American reconstruction. And when they came back, farmers looked through the plan, and they couldn't find the Campesino Campesino movement and they couldn't find any reference to sustainable agriculture or agroecology. In fact, they couldn't find any reference to agriculture at all. The plan for the reconstruction of Central America after Hurricane Mitch was to abandon these farmers, to abandon the peasantry. They figured the richer farmers would, would be able to refinance their own reconstruction. But they weren't going to help the, far the poor farmers refinance anything rebuild anything. They decided what the poor farmers had to do was they had to move to the Pacific Plain where they were going to set up a whole chain of sweatshops and infrastructure so that Central America could enter the global economy by selling manufactured goods and cheap clothing. And in one fell swoop, do away with their peasantry and enter into the modern world. I don't know what blithering idiot at the World Bank thought up this scheme. Or maybe it was the Inter-American Development Bank. But whoever thought that Central America could compete with China in textiles? So the plan was a horrible flop, a complete failure. No one invested. Farmers were abandoned. They started going hungry. Then the free trade agreements hit. The price of their goods fell through the floor because of all of the corn uh, which was being imported without any duties from overseas. They went bankrupt. And we get what were at that time, I'm talking about 1998, 1999, 2000, what I consider to be the first climate refugees. Because people start to leave en masse. The farmers from Campesino Campesino didn't leave, they stayed. However, they're producing at about 25% capacity because they've got no market, and their children have to leave because there's no future in peasant agriculture. So I wanted to tell this story because I think it's emblematic of our climate dilemma, our food dilemma, and our agricultural dilemma. And I think it's emblematic because what we find in this story is a globally underserved community of people of color who develop a visionary strategy for climate resist resilient food production, which is tremendously effective. And yet there are structural decisions, and this is very important, structural decisions which are made by the institutions that, that control the global economy that dismiss this contribution to the public good in the name of economic development. And they take advantage of the disaster to dispossess people of their livelihoods, who then become the first climate victims. And the communities shift from a constructive socio-environmental proposals to survival strategies. So, they should have had a climate action plan and they should have had a food action plan. Luckily for you, you do. Seattle has a climate action plan and a food action plan. I found them online. Um, take a look. They're not so bad. Unfortunately, they don't relate to each other at all. But um, that's okay because from what I hear, no one's paying attention to them. But they're there and you could use them. I think they're very important. Because as you can see, what failed for Campesino Campesino was precisely this engagement in the public sphere to determine the future, to determine policy, to determine reconstruction, to determine how people are going to face the um, hazards of climate and the imperative of producing food. 
And luckily, in Seattle and in the United States and in California, where I live and I'm from, we have a very vibrant food movement. And we're really proud about it in California. We're, so, we're sort of insufferable in that way. We're, almost, we're like Vermont, you know. We, <laughs> We think we're really something with our food. But then so does Portland, and, and I, I think you guys kind of do, too. But, and you should. I mean, there's all kinds of things happening which are extremely important. You know, the farmers markets and school gardens and farm to school programs, food hubs and CSAs, organic farming, urban farms, locally grown stuff. You know, it's, it's bursting out all over. This is really important because we have such a terrible food system. We want to replace it with something. But if we're as concerned about people as we are about our food, we can't ignore the fact that we have a racialized food system. And you can start by realizing that one in seven people in this country is food insecure. Um, California, we're the most productive agricultural state in the union, um, has around, it has over, from 11 to 13 percent of food insecure people. So do you, actually. Um, and who are these food insecure people? Overwhelmingly, people who are food insecure in our country are people of color. African American, Latino, Islander. These are the people who are food insecure twice as much as our um, Anglo populations. And not only are they food insecure, they suffer the highest rates of diet-related disease. Now, you probably all know this may not know that most of the people, that the highest levels of food insecurity and diet-related disease are in the food sector. Those people who pick the crops, process the food, cook the food, might even serve the food, but mostly they're in the back of the house, um, are people of color and have the highest rates of food insecurity. And we did studies in New York and in San Francisco and we find that restaurant workers have the highest rates of food insecurity in the Bay Area, and that um, it's, this is correlated with how fancy the restaurant is. The fancier the restaurant, the higher the food insecurity. Think about that next time you order arugula. Now, this parallels the global situation, because globally, one in seven people are, are food insecure. And yet, we talk about the poor as being food insecure, poor countries as being where we have food insecurity, right? And yet here in the richest country in the world, we reflect the levels of food insecurity worldwide. And of course, Bill Gates is convinced that he's going to be the one who finally brings the green revolution to Africa, and he's going to save Africa from hunger. Um, if Bill Gates was really concerned about hunger, he would be working in Asia and the Pacific, because that's where most of the hungry people are. So why is he working in Africa? Well, the simple answer is, I mean, the, the generous answer is, because Asia and the Pacific already had a green revolution, so <laughs> it clearly didn't end hunger. So we can't talk about that. We'll talk about Africa not having had the green revolution, and that's what's going to end hunger. Fact is, we've been producing one and a half times enough food for every man, woman, and child on the planet for decades. And this green line, which you see there, is food production per capita. That's 12% per person per year. It keeps going up and up and up, and you can take this back several decades. That means each one of us, doesn't matter how many people are born each year, everybody who's born gets 12% more. And we all get 12% more, theoretically. But because of that little, those blue diamonds, which are absolute poverty, you get the orange dots, which is undernourishment. Because the problem is not that we don't have enough food. The problem is not scarcity. The problem is people are too poor to buy the food. And who is too poor to buy the food? Farmers. Farmers are too poor to buy the food. The hungriest people in the world are farmers. 70% of the world's hungry are farmers. And 70% of those are women. And those women happen to produce half of the world's food. So the people who feed half the planet are going hungry. And these people happen to be people of color. So you begin to see how our racialized food system is structured in on a global level. At the time of the 
famous 2008 food crisis where prices skyrocketed and a billion people went hungry, we had actually, that was record hunger. We'd never had a billion people go hungry before. We also had record harvests. We'd never produced so much food as in 2008. And there were record profits for Archer Daniels Midlands, Monsanto, Cargill, Syngenta, General Foods, Walmart, Safeway, Tesco, you name it. The monopolies who dominate our, food, our global food system. So they were making record profits at the time we had record hunger around the world. If you look at the history of the price of food, this is the food price index, you can see that it's been going down ever since the 1900s. You can also see it's very volatile, that if you have wars or you, if you have an oil crisis or something, it's, they're going to spike, and spike and drop and spike and drop. But basically, this is a straight line going, this is a curved line going down, which means what? The price of food is going down all the time because we're producing too much of it. So counterintuitively, it's not scarcity that produces hunger, it's overproduction that produces hunger. And how is this? How can this be? Because it's industrial agriculture that's producing this food, ostensibly cheaply because they don't pay any of the externalities and they don't pay the labor for what it's worth. And so food is sold very cheaply and that puts small farmers out of business or makes them extremely poor and these are the people who go hungry. So in the increase in industrial production of food is what causes hunger. You can see these are the two spikes, one in 2008, another in 2011. You can see that the red lines, these are the incidents of food riots. The second set of red lines there, that's the Arab Spring. So you've got to watch out for these food riots. They can topple governments. Um, and you can also see that when food gets above, the food price index gets above 180 or so, um, you pass a threshold and you enter into a state of sort of food rebellion. And you can begin to expect a lot of unrest unless you quickly solve the problem. A lot of talk about why this happened, these spikes. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of it, except that there was, as the price of food began to bump up a bit because of agrofuels agro made grains scarce on the market because of the low, low value of the dollar, um, because so much food was being channeled into feedlots and whatnot. Um, because the price of oil went up, and so since our food travels something like 2,500 miles from producer to consumer, the price of food begins to go up. But then when Wall Street gets a gander of this, they begin to bet on the price of food, and they pump the price of food up. And speculation basically sends the price of food higher than anything we've ever seen in the history of capitalism. But the real reason why this is even able to happen is because we have a food regime with a very concentrated food system which is structurally vulnerable to environmental and economic shock because we only, because it's dominated by just five crops and just a handful of varieties, it's dependent on fossil fuels and very high external inputs, and it's controlled by the grain traders, the seed and genetic engineering companies, and most of all, the most powerful concerns in the food system are the retailers, the supermarkets. They control it at both ends. This didn't happen overnight. We're probably in our third regime stage of food regimes. The first food regime was the colonial food regime, um, which was accomplished basically through genocide and dispossession, slavery and indentured and bonded and coerced uh, labor. Um, in which the Global South uh, produces cheap food and raw materials for the industrialization of the Global North. This switches around after World War II, where we have a lot of nitrates and poisons left over and a tremendous machine capa uh, machinery capacity. And so we plow them into agriculture in the United States because our mainland was not touched by the war. And we had all kinds of money left over from the war. Uh, our Wall Street did, at least. Tons of money to invest in agriculture. We begin to overproduce in this country. We send the 
the surplus to Europe because they're rebuilding and they need the food. Pretty soon we start sending the machines over there, we start sending the seeds over there, they start overproducing, and then the big inversion takes place, and the North begins to send food to the global South. All this time it's been the South sending the food to the North. Now the North sends the food to the South, but the South already has food. So they have to destroy the food systems of the South. They have to convince everybody that the South is dying of hunger and needs this technology and needs this food and needs all of this Yankee know-how. Um, but to do that, they have to destroy what's there. Otherwise, there's no room for it. This is what capitalism calls creative destruction. The food regime we're in now, the neoliberal or corporate food regime, basically came about through the structural adjustment periods of the 19. 80s and 90s, the gene revolution, the GMOs through the 90s, and the free trade agreements um, up to the present day. NAFTA, CAFTA, now we've got TTIP and the European Free Trade Agreement. And the move by Wall Street and Bond Street to invest less in the real economy and things that actually produce things and invest in the finance economy, the finance sector. And the finance sector has an uncanny ability to squeeze wealth out of existing sectors and products and amass it elsewhere. Um, we also see a lot of land grabs because they don't know what to do with all this money, so they're buying up all this land because you don't want to keep it in the bank because it's going to lose value. And we're in a recession, so what, kind of, what are you going to invest in? No one's buying anything. So invest in land. They're not making any more of it. Um, this is paralleled by massive immigration. Our migration from the global south into Europe, into the United States, from uh, dispossessed agrarian communities, and um, the explosion of the, of the prison industrial complex and uh, the new Jim Crow uh, laws. And we begin to see that the brunt of this process of the construction of food regimes falls heavily and most violently on people of color from the global south and here in communities in the north. So the results have been devastating. The south used to produce a surplus of a billion dollars of food every year. Now they import $11 billion. Industrial agriculture uses up 80% uh, of the world's fresh water and produces, depending on how you calculate it, 20 to 40% of the world's greenhouse gases. We've lost 75% of our crop diversity. And of course, massive immigration um, and an explosion of diet-related diseases that in the US costs us $150 billion a year. And this is paid by the public, right? There's an externality from our food system which the private concerns don't pay, but we all pay. And certainly the families who are subject to diet-related disease like diabetes pay the, the hardest, the worst. Um, we also see the destabilization of the climate, the frequency of severe weather events, and the increased vulnerability to environmental and economic shock of communities around the world. But I think one of the most tragic losses, strategically, is the loss of the public sphere. Because over the last 30 years, what we've seen is the privatization of everything, right down to our relationships. So those social institutions which used to protect us from the volatility of the market, which used to protect us from uh, the volatility of the climate, um, which used to ensure that uh, we were fed, we were educated, we were housed, um, not just government, um, also community organizations as well, social organizations as well, have all been destroyed. And this is why you see the rise of violence in so many poor communities um, because these institutions are under such strain from globalization, mm. which is what this process is, is commonly referred to. So it's not, shouldn't be, we shouldn't be surprised to see an explosion of police violence and murders of young black men and women by police departments around the country. Um, given that all of these institutions, including our, our, um, our local government institutions, have been defunded and uh, hollowed out and um, disintegrated. And this is precisely at a time when we need our public sphere more than ever before to deal with the problems of our food system and of climate. 
So I'd like to say that I think that the corporate food regime has its overlaps and has an analogy with the corporate climate regime, particularly because of its dependence on petroleum, um, but not just that. And I think that um, if we look at industrial agriculture as a major contributor of greenhouse gases, deforestation, species extinction, global warming, and we look at the GDP, you know, GDP and, and, and um, global warming kind of go hand in hand. The better your GDP, the, the worse your global warming is going to be. That's sort of how capitalism works. Um, but these are all correlated. They're all going up. You know, agriculture is the major source of um, land use change today. And this is agriculture for soybeans, you know, and for palm oil, not necessarily for food that people eat. Um, it's for animals and for, um, and for cars. And, but this is where you begin to see the inextricability of the climate crisis and the food crisis. And of course, the hazards of the corporate climate regime are well known to all of us, I'm sure. As the temperature goes up one degree, two degrees, three degrees, we begin to unleash a series of hazards across the, across the globe. And they don't fall evenly, of course. Um, they fall unevenly. Um, but what's important to understand about climate hazards is that they can become climate disasters. And they become disasters if the population, which is subjected to the hazard, like a hurricane or like a drought or a flood or a heat wave, um, is vulnerable. If the, if the population subjected to the hazard is not vulnerable, then you don't have a disaster. You just have a lot of rain or it just gets really hot. But nobody dies. Nobody has to immigrate because you're resilient. Well, that resilience isn't just biological. That resilience is social. That resilience depends on the, the level of poverty or hunger or the level of market power or how much land you have access to or what quality of land you have access to. So if we really want to mitigate climate disasters, we have to reduce vulnerability. To cope with climate change, there are two main strategies. One is adaptation, which means you adjust by reducing to, to severe climate events by re reducing vulnerability to the impact. The other is mitigation, which is you reduce your greenhouse gas emissions and you try and capture some carbon so things don't get worse. But what nobody wants to talk about in Paris, or Kyoto, from Kyoto to Paris, what no one wants to talk about, Copenhagen, you name it, is remediation, which is you address the causes of greenhouse gas emissions and you address the cause of social environmental vulnerability. Why are people vulnerable? How can we change that? Why are we continually emitting greenhouse gases through this agricultural model? Why don't we change the model? Why haven't we been able to change this model? Why is the model itself so resilient, but in fact, but in fact society is not? Okay. So people don't sit around with their arms crossed. They stand up and fight. And we have a very vibrant climate justice movement. Um, and I think the climate justice movement, at least in the United States, has grown from the environmental justice movement, which grew from the civil rights movement, um, very much addressing the uh, environmental justice concerns of poor communities continuing to be overly polluted um, and contaminated, um, and now having to uh, address the worst effects of climate change um, with the least amount of resources to build their resilience. Because climate is a global issue, the climate justice movement is also global. It's not just about local, what's happening in our backyard, what's happening in our region, but in fact, um, how do we actually mitigate climate change? And so you have some very radical proposals from the climate justice movement to cut greenhouse gases 50% by 2020, 90% by 2050, um, reparations, pay for the climate debt of people who are suffering from climate change, 
and of course massive investments in renewables and um, decommissioning these carbon markets was just another way to make money off somebody else's um, disasters. Um, and incorporating, incorporating human rights into the UNFCCC, incorporating human rights into the agreements around climate change. So not just about, and how, ensuring human rights. What human rights were well, the right to food, <laughs> the, the right to live, in one place the right not to migrate, you know, series of rights. And of course, the other side of it is very practical. It's about building local living economies, then ex ending extreme energy, bringing in green jobs, zero waste, looking at public transportation, clean community energy, regional food and water systems. You can see where a lot of these things really overlap with the local food movement. These are the types of things we need for a healthy local food movement. And the food movement in its most radical form is about food sovereignty. It's about democratizing the food system in favor of the poor. It's about taking back control over the food system, not just access to good food, but controlling the system itself, controlling the wealth in that system so that the food dollar stays in the community stays closer to the farm, isn't gobbled up by the monopolies. And it's about agroecology. It's about cooling the planet by capturing carbon through farming, not emitting greenhouse gas emissions, capturing. And establishing a sanctuary, free GMO, a sanctuary of GMO-free agrobiodiversity. Because when GMOs crash, and they've already started to crash, where are we going to get the new genetic material? Not from the seed banks. And here we have the food justice movement, which is really a movement of movements. If the food sovereignty movement is very international in scope, very structural in its focus, the food justice movement is based on the civil rights movement, based on equity, based on economic justice environmental justice, has many different roots. So, if you don't remember anything else from what I said tonight, because I've covered a lot of ground, remember that we have a capitalist food regime. It's no other kind. It's not socialist, it's not anarchist, it's not social democrat. It's a capitalist food regime. Okay. Thank you, Occupy. I can now say capitalism out loud and not be laughed off the stage. Capitalism, we know some things about. It always goes through two periods. It goes through a period of liberalization and a period of reform. We're in a period of liberalization right now. They liberalize the market. Everything is privatized and you get tremendous concentrations of wealth. Last time this happened was in the, 19, the roaring 20s. But if, if liberalization was able to continue indefinitely, it would destroy the social and the material basis of capitalism itself. So usually you get reforms come in. Um, and you get a reformist period, like the New Deal. But these only come in if you have a strong social movement which ushers them in. Roosevelt would not have been able to bring in the New Deal had it not been for the fact that everybody was taken to the streets. We had powerful labor unions, we had powerful political parties. It looked like capitalism was going to fall in the U.S. It looked like the government could fall. And then it came to the negotiating table and they introduced reforms. So where we are today, and I think this is historically really very promising, because I know I've probably depressed you, but if we look historically at, the, at capitalism and we look at the corporate food and climate regime, we see that it's made up of neoliberal and reformist trends, but the neoliberals are really the ones who are powerful. The reformists are pretty weak. But our counter movement are the food and climate movements, the food justice movement, which is very progressive, and the food sovereignty movement, which is very radical. The food justice movement is getting it done in the hood, right? And the food sovereignty movement is really political. Okay, let's take agriculture out of the WTO. In fact, let's abolish the WTO. Let's change the rules, let's change the institutions. Hmm? Otherwise, these great things that the progressives are doing don't stand a snowball's chance in hell. So the challenge is, can we build strong alliances between the progressives and the radicals, powerful enough, to usher in reforms, to create the political will within the regime to usher in reforms, to scare them enough that they bring in reforms. Because they don't do it until they're scared shitless. Pardon me for saying regime. Um, 
this is an historical uh, project. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of experience doing this. And there are a lot of obstacles to this. It's very hard to do. Otherwise, we would have already done it. We need to build the transformational movement. I would say it is in construction, but we are identifying some very important obstacles. One is, we have all these diverse movements. How are we going to bring them together? How are we going to converge in all of our diversity? We don't have a plan for doing that. Political parties don't seem to work anymore. The unions don't work the same way they worked before. Things are very different today than they were back in the 30s. We've got to somehow bring these different groups together. We need to repoliticize a lot of these social movements because many of them become depoliticized. Why? Because the old politics stopped working. Capitalism moved on. So people gave up. Can't give up. We need to build these strategic alliances and we need to overcome the historic divides, the things that keep us apart. And I want to say I think that racism is one of the main things keeping us apart. And of course sexism and of course classism. But I think that we've just got racism so embedded within the structures of our food movement and within the structures which produce climate change that if we don't address racism, we're not going to be able to build a powerful movement. We're not going to be able to bring about the changes that we need. Why is it so hard? Well, for one thing, internalized oppression <laughs> is devastating. And for another thing, white privilege is too. And we need to figure out ways to address both of these things. Because if there's anybody who can lead these alliances, it's those people who have no other options. It's those people who are most negatively impacted by the food and climate regimes. It's the people of color of this world. And so that's the leadership that we have to develop. And to do that, those of us who are white need to address our white privilege. And as a man of mixed heritage, I can say those of us of, who are people of color need to address our internalized oppression. And this isn't easy to do because it's extremely painful and traumatic. I mean, genocide, that was pretty traumatic. Dispossession, that's pretty traumatic. Indentured slavery, indentured uh, service, that's pretty traumatic. Um, luckily, we do know how to deal with trauma. And I, I would refer us to many of the indigenous communities in this country who have been dealing with trauma for quite some time the trauma of genocide and dispossession for quite some time and know a lot about it. Now, they're not the only ones, but we have to find a way to bring this into the food movement. Because not only do we have to dismantle racism in the food system, we have to dismantle racism in the food movement itself. Which means we have to dismantle racism in our organizations and within ourselves. So, this is a massive and unavoidable project. The tools are there to do it. We need the will. And I would say we need a vision. I think we can do this if we envision a world and if we envision a food system in which our food workers are food secure. In which farm workers get living wages and have decent working conditions for dignified livelihoods. And when women are recognized as producing half of the world's food, and a food system in which black lives matter. Thank you. So the question was, um, in the chart, the food justice and food sovereignty were separated. Um, what are our opinions on that, and how do we um, see them coming together, is that right? Well, you know, the food justice movement or the local food movement oftentimes is about, you know, gardens and, and getting healthy, healthy foods into local communities, um, very often situated in underserved communities and communities of color and, and just the difficulty, based on the difficulties about diet, you know, and, and uh, diet-related disease and how to improve diet and, and by taking hold of, of production. But what we found is that it's really important to build alliances um, with food workers between, between communities, uh, organizations which are based in community, and organizations which are labor-based within the food system. 
So um, building alliances with uh, restaurant workers, for example, or alliances with uh, the workers of Walmart, um, or the, you know, for, for um, d uh, raising minimum wages um, at fast food restaurants, uh, alliances with, uh, with ROC, the Restaurant Opportunity Center. Um, I mean, let's face it, I, I don't see how we're gonna change the, transform the food system if we don't do something about Walmart. And I don't think you can do anything about Walmart unless you work with the workers, because Walmart is the largest employer in the world. And many of those workers are, are very poor and are forced to eat lousy food and suffer from diet-related disease and other, as well as you know, wage theft and everything else. So it seems to me that's a very natural alliance um, that is being built and a very important one. Another strategic alliance, and I think we have to distinguish between strategic and, and tactical alliances. Another strategic alliance is um, between Via Campesina and the World March of Women. Because Via Campesina said, well, we can't have women produce half our food. We can't have food sovereignty unless um, there is an end to all violence against women. So an end to all violence against women is our platform for food sovereignty. And they came to this in dialogue with the World March of Women who said, you know, we can't have justice for women unless we have food sovereignty because women produce most of the world's food. So you can see it was a very deep structural alliance and um, strategic alliance where it has tremendous implications for Via Campesina as a federation and how they make decisions and how, you know, what, they, what campaigns they decide to do, how they decide to structure their leadership and these types of things. So those are the, the strategic alliances I think that, that we need to pursue. So here's the flag of the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance. We both belong to the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance. Um, and the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance was started at the height of the food crisis um, to figure out you know, what, what can we do immediately on the issue. And um, it was mostly NGOs. It was mostly non-governmental organizations which started the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance. And it was those who could afford to fly to Washington on their own dime for the first meeting. And that was good because it got things going, but it was bad because it determined the demographic of the group. You can imagine, it was a fairly privileged group and uh, almost all white. And um, since that time, the Food Sovereignty Alliance has taken very strong steps to um, ally itself with specific community struggles of peoples of color. In other words, not expecting people of color to come into the alliance, but rather, going to communities and, and asking, what can we do? How can we help? How can we mobilize? And, and slowly but surely, um, the Food Sovereignty Alliance has begun to um, take on a different form of leadership. And um, so, for example, now, at first, there was only one Food Sovereignty Prize. And it almost went, always went to someone who was international. The first one went to Via Campesina, you know, because they're so radical, right? And this is the Food Sovereignty Prize supposed to be radical. And um, then we decided, you know what? We have to do two prizes. We have to do a national prize, and we have to do an international prize. And the national prize almost inevitably goes to some food justice organization. This year, for example, it went to um, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives and to uh, OFRANEF, which is an indigenous Honduran uh, group from the Atlantic coast in Honduras. So we're splitting the prize now. And I, I think it's reflective of the changes which are taking place within the Food Sovereignty Alliance. The, the whole supermarket question is, is key. Um, and what we have to realize is that the supermarkets are heavily subsidized, the chains. Um, so when a Walmart comes in, usually wherever they go in has to cough up a, at least a couple of million dollars, particularly because the wages are so low that most Walmart workers have to get food stamps, you have to get EBT. Uh, they rely on public assistance in one way or another. So the public pays, and this has been um, calculated in different studies, how much it really costs society to put in a Walmart um, in your neighborhood. It costs a lot of money. And what also tends to happen is very often they're given incentives, tax incentives, and paid money to come in and whatnot. Um, so first of all, we, we need to stop doing that. Um, and then second, don't let them in. I mean, it's just, don't let them in. Um, there are many other models for food provisioning and uh, you know, grocery provisioning that can, can be used. In, um, particularly in underserved communities, in, in Oakland, 
we're working on a model that the people's community market is a model which is fairly small compared to a Walmart, um, like a large grocery store. But the grocery store also has a whole range of uh, community services and is a central point for um, uh, community discussion, for childcare, for um, youth activities. You know, you know, it's a very vibrant part um, of the community. And the difficulty now is that the land has become so expensive in, uh, in Oakland that it's necessary for the government to step in and subsidize the acquisition of this land. You're, you kind of need the three uh, legs of the stool. You, know? you, you need the public to step in. Um, you need the government and you need the private sector. And they all have to be there. Um, and the question is, you know, who has the power in that? And we think that the public should have the power in that. Um, so I think that, that uh, we can go a long way to changing the, the supermarket model. And there are many allies there, including farmers, who are getting gouged by um, the supermarkets, particularly Walmart, and the workers. So the, the industrial meat complex um, is also subsidized. It's subsidized environmentally, um, and it's uh, subsidized directly by, the, st by uh, the state and by our tax dollars. So if, for example, we would stop subsidizing um, the production of soy, of soybean, um, you would kick the, the legs out from under the industry overnight. Mm -hmm. If we started charging um, large soybean plantations for the amount of nitrates they produce, for the amount of methane they produce, for the amount of uh, um, uh, greenhouse gases they produce, um, they would become uh, uncompetitive. Mm -hmm. And if we paid the true pri price of, uh, of petroleum for the transport of all these goods, um, they'd be knocked right out of the market. So, you know, these large CAFOs, and if they were, if, if they were pay, if they had to pay for the contamination they do in terms of the manure, the manure contamination or not, they wouldn't be competitive. So basically, you have to internalize the externalities, make them pay, and then they, they you know, the, these are people who all they talk about is the free market. Um, the free market would kick them right out. 